I do think I'm comfortable with ambiguity. It's difficult to explain、yeah. the origins of that、yeah. comfort. In other words, I don't. I don't really think ambiguity or doubt are obstacles that、oh, I necessarily that、right? I necessarily want to overcome. In、yep. you know, and and for me, it's not. It's not about. I still have conviction, even though I have ambiguity and doubt. So that's the weird thing that's hard to put into words. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's sort of a a strange balancing act that I too have, being sort of profoundly agnostic, but also sort of having a, a profound acceptance. There's some cognitive dissonance that I think is acceptable when you're when you're dealing、mm. with with something、uh, these complex topics. It's it's said in the rabbinic tradition that God's seal. Um, a seal being like the thing that a king would put on the letter, or you know, to to prove that that letter was authentic. This was、nice. before block blockchain.、Um, <laughs> God, bit, God,、yeah. God's seal is truth, and literally, the word for truth in Hebrew is emet.、Um, you, you might know the name emet.、Um, so emet is God's seal, meaning if you would just see the word truth, that that is supposed to be it, as if the the trace of God's presence in the world. And I think that's a very powerful image for a couple of reasons. One is,、um, it's the seal of God. It's not God, so it's、right. the trace, right? You don't actually get God by getting the truth. But there's some implication that if you pursue the truth, that will take you to God. And there's a phrase、um, from, I think David Hartman, who's a rabbi, who said, you know, the God who hates lies.、Um, I think like. If you're authentically pursuing truth, that it leads you to atheism. You know, I personally disagree with that conclusion, but I think God would rather you pursue truth and come to that conclusion than, you know, to self-deceive or to say, "Yeah, I'm going to believe in God just because." I think.、Um, I mean, I don't know if I would entirely stand by that, but I think like there's a religious virtue in being a truth seeker and a truth teller. I don't necessarily believe in getting outside of your upbringing or identity and like looking at all the options with a sort of neutral, unbiased objectivity and saying this is the best one. Like, part of the appeal is that it's mine, that it's been given to me, and that I can trace that back for thousands of years through a family tradition. And so, separate from the merits of Judaism relative to the merits of other traditions, like I feel a sense of responsibility to continue this one because this is the one I was born into. Um, and I think that Judaism, in terms of its content, also would would agree with that. That, in other words, there's like a, a moral and ontological salience to something being given to you, and that being a reason to commit to it, not just that you happen to like it or agree with it.、Um, can, can we dig into that a little bit more? I, sure. Is there any is there any conflict between let's call it obligation and the pursuit of truth that arises from that? Yeah, I'm sure there is,、um, but like, I don't really feel that Judaism is making truth claims that that disagree with other truth claims. It's more a way of being for me. So,、um, I believe it's a good way of being. I mean, this this I believe. Like,、um, people who have the ability to engage with a tradition in a in a way that where it isn't coercive but where it's empowering, I think are just in a Profoundly privileged position. There are very few people in that position because most of the way that religion is expressed in the world, it's often、um, what's called heteronymous. Like people are sort of accepting it because of you know punishment or social ostracization or you know fear of God doing something to them or you know whatever it is. But on the liberal side, like I think most people I know are just very unmoored、um, from any sense of tradition, and I don't think that that's good either. So like. Essentially, there's like a small center in the Venn diagram where you're trying to get traditionalism without the, you know, the damaging effects of being traditional. And I'm not saying that that like makes total coherent sense. Like, there's definitely some cognitive dissonance and you know, compromise and thinking. Like, it's not it's not seamless, but it's deeply meaningful.、Um, I don't think there's anything that I believe、um, that I would posit as like scientific truth that contradicts my religion. But I've had enough religious experience to feel like I'm willing to stake my life on the existence of a benevolent God who wants me to live a purposeful life. And、um, in my case, living a purposeful life means living it within the framework of a Jewish orientation. But I see no,、um, 
reason why somebody couldn't live a purposeful life within the orientation of a Islamic or a Christian um, or Hindu uh, way of being. And I hope that like sort of at a meta level, if you, in each of these traditions, there's an opportunity for someone to sort of model um, that centrist approach that's trying to simultaneously be uh, committed to something that has longe longevity and also not being a, you know, a medievalist, so to say. Um, that my life doesn't begin when I'm born and doesn't end when I die. Um, I can't really tell you much more about what the soul is and what that even means. But, um, you know, Plato thought or Socrates thought that the soul was immortal. Again, like that is kind of incoherent to me. I don't know what that immortality of the soul means. But I, I generally agree with the sentiment that like while we're here on Earth, we think it really matters that we're here on Earth and we need to in a way bracket that fact. But from another point of view, like we're here to go on an earthly experiment as spiritual beings and contribute something and fix something and learn something and heal and experience drama and agony and um, grow. There's an idea in the Jewish tradition that some people gain redemption over a lifetime and others gain it in a moment, in a single moment. So like, uh, right, some people work really hard day after day, banging their head against the wall and it adds up. And other people are just sort of fortunate that they get that epiphany. Um, I think the same is kind of true for your purpose. Like some people know what their purpose is and they just are aligned with it. And other people like it takes an emergency in a sense to bring it out. Um, or, and that could be just a very normal person who has, who doesn't think of himself as a leader. And all of a sudden, like they're in Nazi Germany and it's like, are you going to hide, are you going to, are you going to hide some Jews in your house or are you not? Um, like heroism is an op is an option that also can situationally arise. So I think, um, the meaning of all of this though, is to kind of be heroic, basically to, to, to go on a hero's journey and do something that no other person could do. Um, and that you either know what that is or you have to clarify what that is through trial and error. But the world will bring it out of you. At its best, uh, Torah is for everybody. Moses tells the people that God is making a covenant not just with the elites, but also with the water carrier and the, the wood bearer and so on. So I think that that aspiration to make a text that speaks to every aspect of life, every level of sociology, every nook and cranny of psychology is just amazing. And if philosophy can do that, that's also wonderful. But sociologically speaking, we are best when we live in community. And I don't really see philosophical community happening at the scale that Jewish community happens. So that's a kind of utilitarian answer. That That's like the answer of, hmm, what should I buy today? Should I buy this good or this good? Okay. <laughs> but the truth is, it's not so rational for me. It's not that I just went into the grocery store and said, I think I'll buy Judaism and, you know, that looks like a better deal. It's that I am Jewish. It's just how I am in the world. And so it's not even a question of what does tradition do for me or what does faith do for me? It's that I feel profoundly grateful to belong to a tradition. And I feel maybe not sadness, but I, I see people without tradition and I feel that it's much harder for them. Now, obviously tradition has its own burdens. You can get stuck in a uncreative relationship to tra tradition where it seems like this external thing imposed upon you. I think, you know, Kafka and, and many of that generation describe it as deeply alienating. And they were right. For them, it was. And they had to break with tradition. But I feel grateful to live at a time, sociologically and geopolitically, where my experience of Judaism is not Kafka's. And I feel tremendous responsibility because of that, because it seems to be a somewhat of a minority experience to make my experience more available to others, but I'm not in the business of persuading and saying, look, you should really, you know, be more observant or be more learned. I think we're in a time of choice. And so that's, that's the blessing and the burden of, of our liberal moment is figuring out how to authentically choose something whose fundamental tenets are that you don't choose everything, that some things choose you.
I personally am resistant to the value add language because I feel that it's much deeper and more profound than this capitalist framing of like, at the margin, Judaism is better for you. you know? <laughs> it's kind of already capturing religion within the wellness industry. I, I, I'm, my, the, the value add of Judaism is that it's true in, in the deep sense and that a life lived in alignment with truth in the deep sense is, is simply the best life that you can live. But <laughs> saying that, is just begging the question. It's it's fundamentalist, and I don't think it's effective for the kind of people that I find myself drawn to. Maybe there are people who would pass by the stand, the, uh, the college campus, where somebody's saying that, and for them that would be compelling because they want certainty, and they want the ready-to-believe manual, the ready-to-receive manual that says the, the, Judaism stands for these 13 principles, and here's why it's logical and here's our arguments against the competing <laughs> the competing products out there islam christianity secular nihilism yeah here's how we're differentiated in this space you know some people would go for that but that i don't know i'm not that's not my way that's not my way for a lot of reasons so some of it just might be temperamental but i don't i don't begrudge people for whom that is their way or people for whom that's what they want to hear in order to buy my way is more of a demonstration through example, through poetics, and hopefully by being me and not being someone else, I'll also be able to draw in people who who fit with that way, who who would be turned off of you know typical outreach approaches. So I think you know there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room at the at the ground level of the Sinai Mountain for different approaches. And six hundred thousand adult men stood there, 1.2 million people, according to, to some estimates, you know, and so that's a lot of people and clearly one size doesn't fit all. But the second thing I'll say is that in my view of Judaism, there's a lot more room for uncertainty as a virtue. And maybe that's just apologetics. Maybe that is just me trying to give a religious justification for my postmodernism, if you will. But I kind of feel that the image of the, the cloud of God traveling with the people in the desert, right, is, is an image of mystery. The God who says, I'm going to hide myself, is a God, who, uh, a, a God who doesn't reveal God's face to Moses, is a God who doesn't necessarily require us to know in order to be authentic, right? And we, of course, enshrine as a secret of angels, the Talmud says, the principle of Na Sevenishma, we will do and then we will understand. So circling back to your other question about philosophy, I think, you know, to the, the vice of philosophers is they want to understand everything and then they'll do and they don't do anything because there's always more to understand. I fall into that myself. So I, I find the legal aspect and the ritual aspect of Judaism to be a corrective to that Hamlet-esque indecision mm -hmm. by saying, you know what, mm -hmm. just, just, just do it. Put on the tefillin or, or whatever it is, you know, shake the lulav, do something weird, and then figure out what it means to you. But if you're like, hmm, why should I do this? I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Maybe you shouldn't. But then you, what do you, you're just going to sit there asking questions all day and, and the person's got to live. So iterate. So uh, absolutely, the Enlightenment is a crisis, and absolutely, it's an opportunity. Just because I, I, I'm, I'm always drawn to the allegorical, I just I gotta give a, a little mini drash on the uh, the story in the Talmud of Antoninus and Rebbe. They were chavrutas, right? One was the Roman emperor, the other was the uh, the chieftain of the Jewish people, and they learned together. They had both philosophical conversations and learned Torah together. So the clash of civilizations, maybe their peoples felt that, but they themselves as leaders felt great proximity and kinship and the Talmud compares them to a seven Yaakov it says um, don't read the verse uh, two nations in your womb rather two great ones in your womb who were the great ones they were Antonius and Rebbe so in a way I feel that this post enlightenment world we're in is just one in which instead of having two men get together in private now lots of people get to be a kind of Rebbe or an Indian of Rebbe a piece of Rebbe and lots of people get to be a piece of Antoninus because in a democratic age, we aspire at least to unlock the opportunities at the top for more people. So now we get many variations of the Antoninus Rebbe mashup. And that's kind of, I mean, not to flatter myself, but how I, how I like to imagine you know, my trajectory is, is one in which sometimes I play the role of Antoninus, sometimes the role of Rebbe. And the opportunity is what you get from that Kavruta, 